All right. Uh, well, next week we are going to start uh, a series, and we're talking about a time-tested, proven principle uh, for life change. What I think is one of the most helpful principles when it comes to seeing real life change. But today, uh, today I want to start really in the same place we started a little bit over a year ago on January 5th. Uh, was in, Just curious, was anybody here on January 5th, 2020 when we started this church? Yeah, great time to start a church. Glad you were there. Uh, but we talked about this concept of better, better. And really, that is the foundation. If you want to know what we're about as a church, this is really what we're about. And so this is why we want to start here today. Uh, but before I do that, I want to ask you a question. So this last year, 2020, uh, kind of a crazy year, right? Uh, did anybody develop some new habits over the course of the past year? Come on, I'm sure all of us did a little bit, right? Like walking, you know, you go off your afternoon walk, your morning walk, evening walk. That's like a thing now. People, you know, I think we kind of stopped doing that for a little while. Now we do it again. Uh, or bike rides, or maybe you walk your dog now, because that was also a thing. A lot of people got dogs during the pandemic, pandemic puppies, right? Uh, I don't know why anybody would do that, which is why I don't know why my family now has a dog. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, so we picked up a lot of, a lot of new habits. Like another thing is, you know, when you leave the house, I don't know about you, but I always do like the keys, phone, wallet, tap, right? On your way out. Got to do that. Got to make sure you got what you need, right? Well, now it's like keys, phone, wallet, mask, part four. Some are good habits, some are bad habits. Well, one um, habit that I'm not so happy about is uh, watching the news. I started watching the news. Uh, I was never really a big news guy, but I became somewhat of a news guy and because I, I wanted to know what was going on. And if you watch the news in 2020, you know that it pretty much was just bad news all the time, like nonstop bad news. You know, obviously there's everything that's going on with the coronavirus, but then there's, you know, the whole thing with toilet paper, right? And I remember like every day I would come home from work and I would say hello to my family, right? And then I'd sit on the couch and I'd turn on like the update for the day. And it had this red background, this horrible like Jaws-like scary music. It was like they were, it was like every day I would get my daily dose of fear and uncertainty to, you know, come after coming home from work, which is just great and makes for a whole, you know, whatever. Uh, but so, so for me, that was like a really unhelpful unproductive thing. And here's the thing about bad news. Bad news tends to uh, like really push us in one extreme or another. And maybe you can relate to this. Bad news typically either when we hear bad news, either we get so sick of it that we just shut it off and we're like, you know what? Done. No more news. I don't want to know what's happening. Someone else tell me like the important stuff, but I'm just like done listening to the news. I don't want to hear any bad news anymore. And even like not just news that we watch on TV, but other bad news. Sometimes we just like deny it. Don't want to hear about it. Don't want bad stuff. Push it away, right? But then the other extreme is like, well, there's this uncertainty which creates this fear, which actually pulls us in to the news. You know what I mean? It's like this feeling like I'm too scared to not watch the news. I need to know. Like I rem literally one day, I remember after we got this dog, there was this headline. It was like, your dog might have COVID. And it was like, oh, great. Well, now look what we did to the, f and it's just constant, constant bad news. And we either tend to push it away and shut it off or like we're too scared not to watch it. So things were getting really bad and we kind of spoiled the surprise already. But at some point, like God saw our suffering, right? And he was like, they need somebody. And so he sends us Jim Halpert from the office with some good news, right? Does anybody remember this? In case you don't know, uh, this guy, his name is John Krasinski, but we just call him Jim Halpert because that's who he really is. Uh, and he decided he was just going to share good news. Now, good news has kind of the opposite effect, right? Good news actually draws us in. We love good news. This whole network was just dedicated to sharing good news. And the amazing thing about good news is that it doesn't even have to have anything to do with you for you to like it, you know? 
Like, I, like you watch like a little squirrel that can water ski, you know, and it's like exciting. We like that. We want to see it. Or like, you know, those little kitten videos where it's like, oh, this baby kitten, it meows. You know what it meows? It kind of sounds like it says hello, right? And I, that doesn't affect me at all, but I, I got to see this, you know, because it's just good news and we love good news and we crave good news. And so we're drawn to it, whether it affects us or not. And then, of, of course, of course, when it does involve us, it is extremely attractive. Like, we love good news. Just the other day, I was watching the news again, um, and the, there was this interview between an anchor and, you know, somebody apparently who's knowledgeable and needs to be interviewed, and they're asking all these questions about the virus, and they said, the, the anchor said, do you feel like this is the beginning of the end? And the guy, like, looks at the camera, and he's like, you know, we still have to be careful but I feel like this is the beginning of the end. And I'm all by myself, right? My wife is like upstairs and I just stood up and started clapping in my living room because it was like, finally, finally, this is gonna come to an end. It's good news and we all have good news, right? So where am I going with this? Uh, when you think about, when you think about God, the church, Jesus, Christianity, Religion, however you want to brand like this whole package here, honestly, honestly, like being totally real, is it for you good news or is it bad news? Is it something that creates a feeling of like attraction, like that's I want to know more or is it bad news, right? Uh, so before we started this church, we walked around Babylon Village, and we were, I was with my friend, and, you know, we were going around talking to strangers, kind of undercover. We asked them questions about the community, so we were just, like, trying to gather some information. We asked about roads, problems, right? And then at the end, there was really one question that we cared about. We were like, in one word, how would you describe, you know, God, the church, your whole impression of Christianity? And that day, we literally, we literally received all negative feedback. All negative feedback. One person was like, I don't, is that a bus stop? He's like, I don't know, helpful? And that was like, I don't know, I would consider that neutral. That wasn't even positive. But everybody else, it was like hypocritical, judgmental, formal, impractical, unhelpful, cold, distant. There's like one negative thing after the next. And so if we're real, like to most people in our community, maybe not to you, but to most people in the community, this is bad news. The villain in our story here is this caricature of God that doesn't exist. It's a picture of a God who is this angry, power-hungry rule giver who just dishes out commands because he's big and we're small and we've got to listen to him or else. Right? And who wants to be part of that? To the average person in this community, it's bad news. And so what do we do with bad news? Well, bad news, we either push it out or it scares us in. And so you've got a huge, a huge, like the overwhelming ma majority of the population here in this area on Long Island in the Northeast that are like, nope. Don't want to talk about it. Please don't bring it up, especially I'm in a good mood. Can we not talk about religion, right? And it just, or somebody, and it just gets awkward. Why? Because it's bad, bad news to the average person. Or if we're honest, if we're honest, and this might even be like some people, I mean, maybe, I'm, maybe there's some people in this room that feel that way, like that was my story. Maybe, maybe there are some people in this room, like if we're being honest, you've been in church for a while, <clears throat> but maybe for you, it's like, well, okay, I kind of do this because I feel like it's the right thing to do, and I don't really know what's on the other side, and I want to make sure, you know, if something happens to me, I want to make sure, like, you know, I got my cards in order, because it either pushes us out or it scares us in. But what if, really, really, what if it wasn't supposed to be that way? We believe here the reason we started a church and the thing that I think can change like all of our lives here, like we believe that this is good news and we didn't come up with it. 
This was the way it was supposed to be. One of the first times that this whole story about Jesus was presented, one of the first times somebody explained it, this is how it was explained. Maybe you know this, it's part of the Christmas story, and I know we're not supposed to talk about Christmas if it's not Christmas, but uh, this is part of the Christmas story, and here's, here's how it was explained. They said, I bring you good news. Good news, not good news like that's because that's the title of it, but good news like actually this is a good thing. Good news, and this news will cause, like, not just, not another religion, not uh, certain holidays that people are going to celebrate now, but this news will cause great joy. Great joy. Maybe you've heard this phrase before, and so you're like, okay, I'm, yeah, I know, I know what it says. Good news that will cause great joy. We say that. No, no, no. Like, to translate this to everyday terms, it's like, I bring you a message that's going to make everybody happy. And it's good news of great joy for all the people. For all the people. I don't know about you, but if, if we're being real, if we're being honest, if we're not going to pretend, I don't know that this is the way the average person would explain what we believe in our community. And maybe for you, maybe you've been presented a version of Christianity that cannot be described this way. And if it can't, well then, maybe there's more for you to see. This is supposed to be good news of great joy for all people. In fact, like when the people, those leaders of the church, when they got together and they were like, all right, what are we going to call this thing? You know, there was Jesus, he did this thing, right? And what are we going to call? They came up with this word. The word is gospel. You know what the word gospel means? It literally means good news. It's just like the word good and news, boom, together. That's what we're going to call it. So for them, if they went around telling people this story and they were like, uh, that's not good. Well, then it's like you must not have told the story because it's in the name. It's like if I give you an everything bagel and I take off the, you know, the magical mixture on top, which is everything, and remove it, right? It is no longer in everything bagel if you take away the, and in the same way, if you take the good out of this news, it's no longer the message that we believe. So maybe, maybe there's more for us to see. The early church, those same people that decided to call it the good news. The church, like in its purest, healthiest form. They had problems, they had issues, they argued, they weren't perfect. But when things were working right, like good news does, it drew people in. Like people looked on from the outside and they were like, I want to be part of that. And in that time, in that culture, that could cost you your life. They were like, but ugh. Okay, yes, it's going to put me and my family in jeopardy, but that looks so good, I want in on that, even though it may cost me. And so they went for it, and, and there were some people, now, there were some people that wrestled with whether or not it was real. Because this guy, Jesus, like literally a few years earlier, they saw him walking around. Then they heard he died. That was like, people knew about that. But then they hear he came back from the dead. They're like, okay, that, well, that's kind of hard. I, it's kind of hard for me to wrap my head around if that's real, if Jesus really was who he said he was. So maybe people would like wrestle with whether or not it was real, but people weren't wrestling with whether or not it was good. And what's interesting is today in our culture, it's the exact opposite. Like you talk to people and you're like, oh, do you believe Jesus rose from the dead? They're like, yeah, he's the guy, cross, that's like his thing. Cross, resurrection, Easter, right? Yep, rose from the dead. Do you believe it's good? Well, I, that's a different story, right? It's the complete opposite. In our culture, people don't want it to be real because they don't believe that it's good. And that's the problem that we're dealing with here. The Apostle Paul was one of the most influential people who ever lived, right? He was like huge when the church first started. He decided he just wanted to go out and start churches where people hadn't started churches before. Tell people this good news. He committed his whole life to this good news because he loved it so much. And it kind of brings us to this question. We're talking about all this good news. Like, well, what's so good about it? Okay, so like, what is the good news? And what Paul would explain, like as a leader in the church, as, as someone who is making like the impression of Christianity on so many people, people he's like okay like this is what it comes down to this is the thing that you need to know he says this is his words he says this is the reason i bow before the father like when i am praying for you this is what i am praying for he says i pray that you being rooted 
and established in love, like he's just like warming up, right? I pray that you be rooted and established in love, like love is the foundation, right? He says, I pray that you may have power, may have the ability together with all the Lord's people, like all the people that are part of this. I'm praying that all of you, he's still kind of warming up a little bit. He does that. He writes like all, all these crazy run-on sentences. Uh, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to, to grasp, to grasp how wide, how long, how high and deep is the love of Christ. Like, that's what I want you to know, because that's going to change everything. He continues to ramble, as if he can't explain, like, you know, I said the high thing, said the low thing, wide thing, long. He goes on, he says, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Like, it's so, it's so amazing. Like, you can try it, but really, really, no matter how much I pray, really, you're just never going to wrap your mind around it. And then he would go on to say in another letter, like, all of this is demonstrated it's demonstrated in Jesus going to the cross. He says, God's demon, but God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were sinners, like while we were at our worst, when we wanted nothing to do with God, when we were like all our issues, all our doubts, all our mess, like the nastiest of the nastiest, the, the moment after you make the biggest mistake of your life, like right there in that moment, that's the moment I want you to understand Jesus saying, I'll take the cross for him. I'll take the cross for him. For her. Like when we think about Jesus, we think about the cross because he's like the cross guy. It's like, what did Jesus do? He died on the cross. So we just think of him as somebody with a cross. But that's not how it was for most of his life. He was just like a guy who cared about people and, walk, and, and to show those people how much he loved them, he was like, I will take the cross for them. And that, like, according to Paul, he said, that is the purest demonstration of how much God loves us. Not like we have to work our way up, we gotta like earn a certain status before God, and then he's like, okay, now I love you. No, it's like when you want not, when you're like pushing him away, that's when, that's when he made his greatest display of love for us. And like right after that, he says, I think it's like one of my favorite parts, he says, so what do we say to this? Like, how do we respond to this? What can we conclude? He says, if God if God is for us, who could be against us? Like, what else matters, really? If there's a God in heaven who loves me when I don't love him back, when I don't care, when I don't want to think about it, like, how much better does it get than that? And then he goes on in this passage we were talking about in his letter to the church in Ephesus, we call it Ephesians, right? After he prays that they would understand how much God loves them, he continues. And I think this is where it gets, like, practical. This is where it gets cool. This is where it's not just, like, something we believe, but it's something that we do. Something cha that changes our lives. He says, and now, like, closing this, like, after he says his grand prayer with the height and the depth, and, you know, to know it, surpasses knowledge, he says, and now to him, God, who is able to do immeasurably more immeasurably more this word can be translated abundantly like exceedingly above immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power his ability that is at work within us he says and this is kind of like one of those church phrases right that a lot of times we like breeze over and that's like that's nice and poetic but he says to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And he says, amen. And nobody talks like that, right? But what he's saying here is like, I am praying that you will understand how God's love for you is like abundantly more, immeasurably more than all you could ask or imagine. And now to him who is able and willing to do all you can ask or more than all you can ask or imagine, to show you his great love for you. That's abundantly more than all you can ask or imagine. Like, it, he wants to work. He, don't miss this. He wants to work in your life in ways to show you that he loves you. It doesn't mean you're going to get, like, checks in the mail, right? Or that all your sicknesses are going to go away. 
It's not always going to be easy. It's not always going to be fun. It's not always going to be something you want to happen. But if you invite him in, if you live like conscious of the fact that he cares for you and you're looking for it, you will watch him use the nastiest, ugliest, most broken parts of your life and use them to show you just how much he loves you. And that, like, when that sinks in, when that becomes something we don't just say we believe, but when it, like, really sinks in, that's something that changes everything. Everything. Uh, so I'll close with this story, and uh, I'm going to ask the band to come up here in just a minute. But uh, about a year ago, almost exactly a year ago, it's our last service, March, was it March 7th? Something, March 8th? Almost exactly a year ago was the last time we met in person. We met downstairs. And, you know, we heard about the virus. Uh, we found out we were going to have to close down. It was like totally foreign to everybody. And as the weeks went on, we started to realize how this was going to change things. And if I'm being real, right, for me, like my story, my perspective, we had this, like, plan, this dream, this hope for this church. And it looked like for 10 weeks, like, this might, this might actually work. It might be like a cool little thing. And then it felt, it just felt like it broke. Like it just crumped, like somebody kicked over my Lego tower, right? It was just broken. Broken. And, and, you know, you probably know there was all this uncertainty. It was like, well, maybe next month. Well, maybe. I remember the first week I was like, all right, we're not going to cancel two weeks in a row, just one week. I'm going to wait till Friday to cancel the second week. It's like 52 weeks later, here we are. <laughs> we just didn't know. It was painful. It was hard. But if you fast forward to today, right, uh, things have like actually ended up really good, like way better than we would have imagined. We, we would not have, like really could not have conceived that we were not going to be able to meet for a year. And then a year later, we would meet upstairs in a totally changed room that was changed by a team that was newly formed during this pandemic. And it was just, it's just been crazy. Like it blew, it really, really like blows my mind. And this song that we sang before, abundantly more. Dakota sang it. I'm not going to sing it for you. But hopefully you remember the words. It talks about how we have all we need, right? How God's love for us is more than we could ask or imagine. Abundantly more. And I was walking through this building with my daughter. Her name's Mia. She's six years old. And she's heard that song like kind of on repeat in the car. Her and my son, they love it. And they're singing it, constantly walking around the house. They're singing, they're singing abundantly more, abundantly more. She's following me through the building and we get right in that doorway over there. And she looks up at me as she's singing and she stops and she says, Daddy, what is abundantly more? And I opened up the door and it was like right there, I, the whole year flashed before my eyes. And I remember those moments of un uncertainty those moments of fear when things felt broken in my hands, when it was like, this isn't gonna turn into anything. And I looked up at this room and I saw the conversations that were had in this room while our team was painting the walls, the people I met for the first time in this room as they were tearing up the carpets, the relationships that were formed in this room. And I had the chance in that moment to see how this room had physically transformed. And I looked at my daughter and I said, this, is abundantly more and she had no idea what I meant by that <laughs> but I don't think that moment was for her I think that moment was for me and maybe like you're sitting there right now and you're like okay great yeah nice cool your church like it's, it looks like it might work out nice room things are great right but my point here is not about the church the point is that this situation this plan this was my broken this was my, I don't know what to do with this. This was my, I don't know where this is going. And this is where I saw God step in and show us that he cared. And maybe it's for you, it's not a broken plan or a broken church. Maybe for you, it's a broken relationship. Maybe it's a broken dream. Maybe it's a broken marriage. Maybe it's a broken home. 
Maybe it's a broken past, a broken story. Maybe it's a broken body. But maybe right now you're sitting with some kind of broken, like, what do I do with this? And maybe God wants you to invite him in to that situation. And maybe in that, not in spite of that, but maybe through that, God will show you that his love for you is abundantly more. It's immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine. It's a love that surpasses knowledge. And when that sinks in, when that sinks in, that's when we'll realize that this is good news. Let's pray. God, we are grateful that uh, the news that we have, the message that we have is good news. It doesn't have to be good news. It doesn't have to be a story about a God who loves us far beyond what we could comprehend. It could be about a story who's, who's about a God whose love we have to earn, love that we have to work for, love that we have to check boxes off for, but it's not. It's a story about a God who loves us when we are at our utter worst, our absolute worst. And so God, I pray that today, even if we don't, don't believe that it's real, God, would each and every one of us walk out of here today a little bit more confident that it's good, even if we don't think it's real. In Jesus' name we pray.